Ciao Caterina. Ciao. Caterina Vezzoli, thank you very much for joining uh, this new web series, which I call War as Reset. Uh, many wish the pandemic was nothing more than a bad dream, a nightmare. The truth is that it is still a reality for most of the world's population as we speak. Let's look at China and uh, lockdown in Shanghai, Hong Kong. Many wish the Russo-Ukrainian war was nothing more than a bad dream, a nightmare. According to psychoanalysis, nightmares can only disappear when their meaning is represented. I'm really happy you are joining this series. You are the first uh, woman I speak to, so thank you very much also for that. And many other will join soon. The aim of these uh, interviews uh, that follow somehow the previous series, Breakfast at Kuznach and Lockdown Therapy, uh, are very important because they're looking for depth. And also follow what Andrew Samuel suggested, that within the both the microcosm of an individual and the macrocosm of the global village, we are floated by psychological themes and that politics embodies the psyche of people. Andrew also underlined and demonstrated how useful and effective perspective derived from psychotherapy might be in the formation of policy, new ways of thinking about political processes and the resolution of conflict. This series is an opportunity, I believe, for depth and to contrast or even compensate the current media voyeurism where we eat war on a daily basis, where war is an attraction the attraction to eat war. We are attracted by war, for example, look at Wotan from 1936 by Carl Gustav Jung, and we wish war to be able as far as possible from us. War as news is helpful to media outlets to sell more and more advertisement, but not necessarily to inform. We saw this during the early phases of the COVID pandemic and even now where we can watch uh, TV channel, even the major BBC, CNN, and they keep vomiting the same information every 30 minutes. I call this media bulimia, which reflects paranoia, panic, selfishness. Katerina, what is war? Well, first of all, Stefano, thank you for what you are doing. And it's very important to speak together about these issues that uh, are changing so much our la life. So, what is war? I think war is a failure. Is a failure. And is a failure for Putin because he's not able to face his opponents in another way. He doesn't even try to say what is about in a way and uh, he wants to show that he's strong that the soviet union is still there mm -hmm. and um, it's still even the superpower uh, that can challenge uh, the west but this is not the only reason for which a war is a failure. It's also a failure for the West that didn't understand what Putin was doing and didn't stop him perfectly knowing, for example, that the money that we paid for the gas or, or the material, raw material that we had, get, had that we get from Russia go through the, the Russian mafia and to the, corrupt, the um, corrupted, uh, let's say, oligarch friends of Putin. It's a failure psychologically, of course, because uh, instead of keeping the tension between the opposite, between the, 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 the two situations, and uh, in this tension, trying to find 
a way to find a new way of going out of this, you fall in one of the poles of the tension. And that is, of course, about possession. And becoming possessed means that uh, you destroy, you are going to destroy everything. So it's really a failure. The other reason probably, because uh, I think it's a failure, it's very personal and it is uh, about uh, my father. My father was a soldier during the last war and he considered, uh, he was prisoner in Germany for two years because he was in Greece in 43. And so he went to, he was a Monday Italian that survived the killing of the German and Nazi in uh, Greece. And he was then in, uh, in a camp, in um, a lager in, uh, in Germany. And my father returned, he was a convinced pacifist. And he thought that war, it's always wrong. And so it's a failure. Probably this influenced my opinion of war, but anyway, I think it's what I think about this, about what war is. Let me share with you what James Hillman, which is one of our ancestors, Jungian ancestors, wrote about war, a terrible love for war. There is no practical solution to war because war is not a problem solvable by the practical mind, which is better equipped for its conduct than for its avoidance or conclusion. War belongs to our soul as an archetypal truth of the cosmos. It's interesting. Mm. War belongs to our soul as an archetypal truth of the cosmos. It is a human work and an inhuman horror and the love that no other love has been able to overcome. Also, this one is pretty strong. Huh? A love that no other love has been able to overcome. We can open our eyes to this terrible truth and becoming aware of it, devote all passionate intensity to undermining the enactment of war, strengthened by the courage that culture possesses, even in the dark ages, to continue to sing as it resists war. We can understand it better, postpone it longer, work to gradually remove it from the support of a hypocritical religion, but the war as such will remain until the gods themselves leave. I like this. I think that we have to change the god. <laughs> this is the point. <laughs> Because, uh, I mean, the god of war are always active, are always there. So we need the, to deconstruct them. We need to enter into it and to deconstruct the, the, them. It makes me think of, um, I mean, uh, Agamemnon, for example. Mm. And... Um, he easily come to my mind when you speak, when uh, uh, Hillman speak of the gods. Agamemnon, he's, uh, Agamemnon, in the words of Clitemestra, he's a coward. He's the, he 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 is somebody unrespectful, ready to sacrifice his daughter to the wind of uh, uh, to the wind of war. Ready to he's the king, but he's not a warrior. He is uh, all. Um, I mean, he is somebody that uh, easily succumbed to his. Uh, to his wish, to his uh, vices. He's really the son of Atreo. Atreo, the, the, the one that kills uh, Tieste, his, his nephew, Tieste's sons. And uh, so, 
everybody despises Agamemnon, but he is the king, and the loyalty of uh, the, the other king keeps him keeps him there. And uh, I mean, what we have to to deconstruct it's this this idea of power that Agamemnon represents. And uh, I mean, the Greek tragedy denounced this, but there wasn't the culture to deconstruct and to differentiate the feelings about the war. So it's something that we have to do. So the, the, the tragedy, the, the Agamemnon teach, the Agamemnon, but also Clitemnestra, teaches us a lot about deconstruction. And uh, I think that, uh, I think Hillman is right. We have uh, to uh, deconstruct the, 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 the god of war. War, failure, as you say, gods. What about instincts? Or as Freud used to say, tribe in German. Because it seems that we are attracted by war. Since war started, when every war starts, remember when the Gulf War started in 1991, uh, we were in front of the TV as long as we could to mm -hmm. really ingest and then vomit, ingest and vomit this information as if it was a movie. Is war in our nature? And I'm thinking of Freud instinct theory. For me, war is the opposite than Truman Capote's vanity fair. It is the atrocity fair. Mm -hmm. But this atrocity fair is a vanity fair for TVs and media outlets that sell more and more without really informing. Yes, you are right. Uh, you are right on this. About instinct, I think that uh, from the Jungian point of view, the instinct is uh, on the same, the material is on the same line and the spiritual. So here too, we need to differentiate what is the wish or the instinct, let's say the aggressive instinct from violence, because they are, the instinct can be a positive thing. Violence is the contrary in a way of instinct. And uh, so what is, uh, important to me it's the fact that uh, we have to keep the tension i'm returning to what i said but we have to keep the tension between the instinct towards aggressing the other and the other instinct that is not aggression but acceptance so it, it's it's always there there's always good and evil in us we have to keep this, in, uh, the, the, to keep this, to be able to keep the tension and to see what comes out when we differentiate, when we differentiate on our wish to kill and what, what, when we differentiate our wish to save or to be the savior. Is war masculine, for example, following Svetlana Alexievich or other authors, especially when looking that, of course, nowadays modern armies have male and female soldiers, but in this war, um, as much as in the uh, demonstration by Ukrainians in the past few years, 2006, 2008, Maidan, 2014, there were as many male as many females. But in 2014, for example, when the police attacked to keep them out from Maidan, 
the women were in the center and the men were protecting them. So mm -hmm. some, also instinctively, but is war masculine, symbolically, mythologically? Well, mythologically, there are also the Amazon and the Valkyrias, I mean, but the point, <laughs> returning to Ragamemnon, it seems that I'm saying that he's uh, masculine. It seems, it seems so. It seems so. Just speaking. But uh, um, well, that may be with and is a butad. Eh? What about Helen of Troy, who could be seen as she calls war, or man got uh, infected by something and there declare war. Well, um, the women of Troy are interesting, and and I mean, think of um, Ecuba. How do you say in English? Ecuba. Uh, so let's say Ecuba, and then people will have to find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Think of her, how strong she was, and uh, even where she was a prisoner after the end of the war, she maintained her capacity. And um, I mean, women were strong because uh, even when they were slaves, they kept their dignity, at least in the Trojan Wars. And when you say this, I'm thinking of the Kurds woman that fought against IS in the past few years. Yes, 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 huh? yes, yes. It seems to me that the difference, and it seems really banal, so I apologize, but it seems what you said, the integrity of a female warrior as an approach that has forward-looking path, while male approach to war is botanistic destructivity. Mm. Well, I think I, I, when I think of the women on Troy, of Troy, I think they are really uh, in themselves. They are suffering, they are going to be slaves, but they keep their dignity. And um, thinking in um, it in a modern uh, way of thinking to this, maybe because uh, women has always been the um, inferior to men in history. I mean, in the Western history, women mm -hmm. has always been inferior to them. They were, they always been the subaltern in, in all situations. And so they know about uh, discrimination. They know about the traumatic use of power that they suffer on their bodies, but also in their life, even they are, if they are princes or, or, or queens. And so probably women are more, they can be good warriors, but they are more open to dialogue, it seems to me, but because they have, uh, they have been, um, as, if, as if the purpose of warfare is very different. Sorry to interrupt you. Do you know what came up to my mind? And I didn't share this in the previous interviews, maybe because there is a man and a woman now. Yes. I thought, uh, I came to my mind Penelope, Odysseus, who is the wife, that she is technically not at war, but she's waiting for her husband to come back. What is she doing? Sewing or tailoring, and unsewing, untailoring at night. Mm. This is an act of patience, of knowing that chronos and time are two different things, and is really the art of waiting. I have a patient who fled Ukraine with her daughters. Her mom decided to stay in, in, in Lviv, Lvov, what we say, Leopoli, because she said, this is my land and I can help. 
she is a woman that decided to stay there and help the military, military sewing these curtains they used to hide. The link between Penelope and this woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's at war, but she's doing something for her country in a different way than the masculine. And this aspect of Penelope waiting, perseverance, patience, and, and believing in, uh, um, let me find the right word. Um, um, ah, it's gone. Anyway, I give it back to you. The I don't want that what I said about women is uh, diminishing for them because no, no. I intend it as an, as an important quality. Is the quality of being in oneself and knowing and to fight for our destiny, for what we want, even if we are considered inferior or are the subaltern in the situation. And I think this is uh, important because uh, it gives, uh, um, I mean, it requires a lot of strength to be in this uh, situation. And also, it's a way of thinking differently, in a different way. The word I was missing is providence. Perhaps this is the difference between war as male or war as female. I feel women have a direct contact with providence or understand the concept of providence better than men. So they can also deal with this concept. I think they are more differentiated on this. Mm -hmm. Probably because they leave the, inferior, the inferiority. They are kept in the inferiority. So are more differentiated, therefore more aware mm -hmm. yes. what is the ultimate meaning of this war let me give you a, a fantasy an idea a proposal there is Kronos and there is Kairos on the one hand I believe that Ukrainians since the early 21st century have told us Europeans Americans something we didn't want to hear we want to be able to self-determine ourselves. We want to live in a status, in a state, in a nation with institutions that are healthy enough, which means they can self-determine themselves. We can have free election, not as corrupt as they are, or as they are, for example, in the West, in the East. An example is, is um, for me, uh, the, the, the US, the US through Trump and the fact that although Trump, although what happened in January 2021, the institution was healthy enough so was able to have the election and a new president was was uh, allowed to, to step in office. This is not happening in Ukraine with continuous influence from Russia, also from the West, Yanukovych, Yanushenko, Maidan. But I wonder whether is there, as we said before, as you said before, you know, come back to the Soviet Union, is there a compensation of what happened at the end of the 80s? So the collapse of the Soviet Union, in similar terms to what happened to Germany or the Germanic country, Germany, Austria, the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, when, when they lost the First World War and uh, Hitler came in power? I mean... You are right about Ukraine. What I thought is that the Ukrainian are teaching us of the West, I mean, us European, how important democracy is, because we tend to forget about it. But and the fact that they demanded, I, I really felt uh, involved by their capacity to, um, to tell us and to show us how important uh, uh, democracy is and how important it is to fight for democracy and for the possibility to determine our life. So I, I agree on this. What, um, 
what is the ultimate meaning of, of the of the war i think is exactly this is the humiliation of democracy is the humiliation of democracy and of the values related to democracy i think that uh, these forces want to demonstrate uh, the superiority of the illiberal values you say liberal yeah i think so mm -hmm. illiberal values over the liberal yeah. values fascism stefano never dies fascism never dies yeah you know what i was uh, we have seen this in, even in in our i mean we have seen this even in our countries even in other countries in uh, i was listening a radio program on uh, Radio Rai Uno yesterday evening. They were talking about a show uh, that is now in Rome and will be in Milan in September from Scurati's book M, the son of the century, M. Mussolini, mm -hmm. in the secolo. Yeah. And the actor, I don't remember his name, is a very popular actor in Italy, theater actor. He said, it's like, and this is very Jungian, but this guy was not Jungian. So when Jung, Jung look in uh, after the catastrophe at Hitler, he's saying basically that Hitler was a mirror of the country. We can say that the media, which I was blaming before, is also a mirror of the country. But in this um, radio conversation, the actor said it could be said that fascism is a virus. Yeah? So people got this virus like COVID, but actually fascism is not the virus, it's something else. Mm. I mean, it's like what uh, Hillman said about the war, fascism, it's always there. Yeah. It's always a tension there, but uh, uh, and uh, we have never definitely got rid of it. And the populism is the new version of fascism. I mean, Salvini for one, but I mean, many others. And this is, uh, um, you know, what this war shows, I think it's this, is that uh, not only in Russia or in, uh, let's say, China, there's this. It's also in our countries. And we have to be aware of this uh, tendency to... Uh, and also, you see, it's about authoritarianism. And uh, this presence of aut authoritarianism, that it's always hidden somewhere, even in the uh, democratic countries. Jung about, uh, not fascism, but more about Hitler, and mm. I would say current populist leaders, mm. talk of them as hystericals who lie, who believe their lie, and are very good in manipulating the country. And we have seen this with Hitler, with Mussolini and with current populists. But this leads us also to talk about father, the archetype of the father, the concept of land, and maybe fatherland. Therefore, Russia, the concept of the father, fatherland, and compensation. I strongly believe, when looking at the father and son relationship, especially father and son relationship, that one, is or believes that his father is a hero like Freud or like Jung, just to take two important figures in psychoanalysis. And one day they discover that their father is no hero, like the hat example with Freud's father or the loss of faith of Jung's father. Their son, 
who thought the father was a hero need to compensate this to regain the honor lost by the father perhaps the honor that they never had so they want to become a hero both freud and jung somehow became heroes in this respect i wonder whether this is what is happening now with uh, putin what happened with hitler and what often happened in in history societies I would like to differentiate uh, my answer. I will start with, with uh, the father and then I will speak of uh, Putin and Russia. I mean, that of uh, that of uh, the dealing with the figure, with the father figure and to deconstruct, not to destroy, but to deconstruct the, the father figure of the parental imago, it's a process necessary in adolescence, because if you don't do that, you end by destroying the father or the mother, by destroying the parents and be possessed by them. So, that of deconstructing the images or the imago of uh, the, the, the father and the mother, it's a necessary process. And uh, there's one of um, the Italian colleague that has written a, an interesting book about uh, um, Jung and uh, the father of, of Paul Achilles Jung, the father of Jung called, uh, what's the title, um, Pro Bono Patris. So, and uh, I'm saying this because I think we have also to consider that I don't know much about the, the, the father of Freud, but uh, Paul Achilles Jung was somebody that had his uh, value, that had his uh, capacity, maybe he wasn't a very good father, but he was somebody very respectful. And uh, Pierre Claudio de Vescovi in his books explained this. So from one side, Jung was, uh, in his way, was right, but the father maintained independently from the son a value. And so in answering to, to this, I, I say to deconstruct the father, not to destroy them, is necessary. We have to do it. Otherwise, we are possessed by, like Agamemnon, by Atreus, and uh, you, and you have to... To respond. And respond. Yeah, and respond. It is uh, an overwhelm of unco unconscious contents. Yes, yes. While for the other part of the um, regarding uh, Putin, I don't, I don't know what to say about uh, Putin really. Uh, I've already said that uh, he is possessed by the idea of uh, of the by the Russian nationalism or by the Soviet idea, but uh, I want to speak of my real, I don't know the Russian, I don't have, I only know one or two colleagues and not very well. But so my real experience about Russia, I've never been to Russia, I've been communist, but I never been to Russia when I was young. And uh, the Russia that I know is that of the novelist. <laughs> Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and also uh, the, the uh, Chekhov, the right, Google <laughs> Chekhov. And um, I mean, that was my first experience of the soul because uh, the capacity of this uh, um, novelist to speak about the different aspect of the soul was incredible. And uh, uh, I liked very much the fratella, the, uh, the brother, brother Karamazov when I was uh, a teenager. 
And it was for me an incredible exploration of the um, of the conflict present in the relationship, but also present inside the, the inside them, not only the men, but also the women that uh, are present in the Fratelli Karamazov. And uh, as a teenager, I liked very much to see this uh, strong feeling, this strong conflict, and how they were treated. And the um, <laughs> one thing is that when I was at uh, Leningrad, mm, uh, sorry, St. Petersburg. Oh, right. That is, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I the fans will be in Leningrad, but anyway, no, because Putin was blaming Lenin for something. But we'll... No, no. Anyway, when I was at St. Petersburg mm. at the conference, I, I was in. But you went uh, to Russia. Uh, yes, but not when I was communist, now. <laughs> But I was at the conference, at the European conference there, and um, I was in a group where the people, uh, I was with, that, with another Italian friend and colleague, and all the group was Russian, and they spoke Russian, of course. <laughs> I was there listening to them, and I, I didn't want to leave because it seemed to me that I was going to offend them. Well, we do it. We are doing this in English. Yeah. So they can listen to us, but it's really a swap we are not used to. Mm -hmm. Why war turns normal people into beasts? I want to finish this. Ah, Sorry. I, I, want to, I was there and I listened to Russian. I didn't want to go. And at a certain point, I had an incredible experience because what came to my mind was that my loved. Uh, Novelists did speak that language, and I, I entered in an incredible, uh, unconscious uh, sort of participation mystique, where I had the impression of understanding what it was uh, said and what it was uh, going on. And I want to say this because I think that maybe I'm not proposing that we have a group of uh, uh, on literature between different cultures. But I think this is important to know this aspect of our culture. It's a way of uh, getting in touch. Well, when and was... Because you see, I mean, somewhere in the Russian culture that we don't see, this is there. Yeah, absolutely. When I was a student of modern literature, uh, one of the courses that I liked the most was comparative literature. That is really to compare the same epochs, yes. uh, so really understand history as something not just nation bound. Mm. Sorry, I wanted to say this because it was uh, very important. Yeah, yeah, an important experience for me. But our conferences, these happen often, where we don't fully understand the language, but there is. Uh, the spoken language and then something that uh, participation mystique when the abasement uh, universal happens so it's really being in contact and this happens every day in every day yes. patients or in the world you know uh, what in Jung what psychological transference and counter transference mm -hmm. is really about this being connected in a much deeper way world turns normal person into beast. What is your opinion to those non-Ukrainians who have enlisted and are traveling to Ukraine? Are they heroes? Are they poor, suicidal, Davids against Gila, idiots? Well, I think it's right to, to fight against uh, the oppression. I never use a weapon in my life, of course, but I think it's right to do to do it. And the Ukrainian are right to to defend themselves. Well, about the people, 
that go there. You know, on February 22nd, when formally uh, Putin had the connection of the, the yes, to, to, to go to, to combat and war, I was working with um, with a colleague, with, uh, with a colleague and a friend on the translation of um, on the translation in Italian of one of of John B.B. Uh, book. And, um, with Lydia Di and Stefano, we can uh, with your friend Lydia Di Stefano. No, it was with the, well with someone Lydia, else. Okay. Lydia was there because she, we are three, but that night uh, she was very tired and. Um, so she left a bit before we ended, and I was with uh, Melania Mento, another colleague. And uh, the last thing we tr we were translating because it's uh, the, um, uh, the, the the it's about the inferior function of uh, uh, Marie Louise von Franz. Well, Marie Louise von Franz says that. From there, from the inferior function, all the projections arise. Yeah. And I think this is the point. So it's right that people uh, go and uh, uh, think of helping also to, to fight. But uh, as you as the inferior function and the projection of the inferior fu function works for everybody, the only thing is that they have to be aware about uh, the projection and about the differentiation on this aspect too. Because if you are possessed by, or you identify with the savior, that is a problem. Let's stay more on the inferior function for those that don't really know what that means. And let me ask you another question, because I would like now to step into Putin. Many are diagnosing him, put out a psychopathology. The same was done for Trump, for Berlusconi. For the bad ones, there is always a diagnosis. You are the first one to bring up the, the the concept of the inferior function. What is the inferior function for Jungians? And um, how could this apply what you just said to Putin? Well, the inferior function is uh, what is unknown to us. And uh, for the Jungians, there, is, there are four functions. One could be the superior thinking. So we are someone that experiences the world through thinking. And the inferior is feeling. Feeling, yes. So when our feelings are hit, or we get hit by the feeling, something happened that overwhelms us. Mm. And I think an example is, is on the media these days, Will Smith and Chris Rock. Yeah. His feeling function was hit by a joke, and he responded in such a violent way. Just for those yes, that yes, yes. So, don't speak our language. Uh, but the inferior function is is something often unknown to the person, exactly because it's inferior. Yeah. And that is uh, that is the problem even with people that go to to fight for the Ukraine. I'm not saying that they are projecting, but I think this could be a problem. I'm answering to your question. What are they? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, even if they are a hero, there's a problem. Because a hero is also in creation. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, going on fr from with your question. Um, so, what is dangerous here is that uh, these people that go to fight, even if they go for the right reason, they might be, um, as they face apocalyptic situation, 
they might lose themselves if they are not really aware of what is happening there. And uh, so they can, again, be possessed. And if they are possessed, they are going to do the wrong things. What is important is that people that are on the front line and that uh, uh, fight on the front lines received some receive some help. Yeah. I'm speaking. We usually speak of supervision, but I'm not only that. Receive some help that keeps them human. Because this is the point. Because even if you are possessed by the savior, or you identify by the savior, there too there's a problem. Because if you are the savior, you are the only one that knows. No. And for Putin, I think the problem there is not psychopathology, it's authoritarianism. Uh, I think that uh, many, many is a malignant narcissist like Trump. Oh, so yes. On the exactly. bad one part, yeah. maybe he is, but he is really a cold blooded killer, which goes along with authoritarianism. All the authoritarian personalities only of the 20th century, but we can go back to the Caesars of the Roman Empire, so on and beyond. Uh, he is a real cold blooded killer that has something in his mind. You mentioned projections. Putin has denounced Ukraine for genocide. Mm -hmm. Isn't this a projection? Of course. It is exactly doing the same now on such a scale. He did it the same in, in, in Grozny, in Chechen. In Chechen. He, he then didn't have the opportunity, thanks God, but Georgia could have been the same. Uh, in Syria, Aleppo was destroyed because of his or the Russian intervention. Mariupol. Yes. Really, really trying to bomb everything. Of course, then we have to think of what the Americans did in Japan. Yeah, with one bomb. And we got to that, we will get to that in a bit. But seems to me that he's projecting and doing a real holocaust. Well, he's doing that, but also I think he's really his project in, is to convince their, his people that, uh, and this is the authoritarianism, uh, and to convince his people that he's right and he's defending them. Yeah. And he tries, uh, to, to, to manipulate, but in the way that he's promising peace. But peace, of course, it's only in the grave. Yeah. But th this is really the aspect of authoritarianism. And it's, uh, it's, I mean, it refers not only to, to Putin. In this moment, it's him and also he has the uh, the nuclear weapons weapons and uh, but really it, is this the manipulation of the authoritarianism and uh, i've seen i don't watch much tv for the reason that you said because uh, i want to be free of to be able to think and uh, and uh, but I've seen on the Italian TV something about uh, the, the crowd around him when he speaks uh, and uh, and uh, what he says and how especially the young people react. I think that what he's doing is to manipulate as the authoritarian people do saying you are going to have all this and I thought that maybe the the, the young uh, Russian as we saw on the Italian TV we especially saw the young people 
following him. And I thought that maybe this is because uh, he wants to convince them that they will be better than the West, that they will have more than what the West is offering, because uh, this is his aim, to show that uh, the Russian or China, it's better than... True, true. we have to... Uh think of also propaganda, what is shown here and there, but we cannot avoid thinking of Eric Fromm, who in 1941 mm -hmm. said that often when people are not able to, to work through the responsibility related to freedom, they choose authoritarian leaders and personalities. Yes. Yeah. And this was happening in, in, throughout the history. We thought this ended after the Second World War. But again, we are remember that in Europe, every 75 years of peace, there is a big war. Yeah. 1848, Austria, the Austrian the Empire, don't worry, don't worry. The Austrian Hungarian Empire went to peace and then again, First World War. The title of this conversation is called War is Reset. Uh, Obama, when he came into power, when he won the election through his Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, hoped for a reset with Russia, with Putin. And there is a gag where Hillary Clinton is giving a reset button to Lavrov, the exterior minister. Obviously, it didn't work. Now we have war. As a, a reset of what? Well, what happens? Uh, my, my daughter is trying to call me, but it's <laughs> come back. Well, um, we have something to reset. We have to become more aware of. Uh, it seems that uh, the Cold War, the Cold War, has finished only for us. Yeah. Only for the West. Yeah. And um, while it never finished for uh, for someone else or for, for someone else, and they got and they got uh, to power. Yeah. And uh, you often cite Gorbachev, and uh, I mean the problem is there. I. I question, but not his name. Putin blamed Lenin for not blaming Yeltsin, who could be his political mentor, godfather, not mentor, but godfather, predecessor, father. Yeltsin was corrupt, was drunken. He sold basically his country to the West. What would have happened to Europe and to Russia if Gorbachev would have been able to stay. Because Gorbachev, in the coup in summer 91, he didn't want blood yeah. to, to, be, uh, to be spread. Yes. So he somehow left or had to leave. Since you were a communist, and let me share with you a joke, a communist Italian style, but what could have been of Europe and of Russia if Gorbachev would have been able to finish his job? They started with Glasnost, transparency, and uh, perestroika. Well, we would be in a better world, <laughs> for sure. You know, I was reading, I think, uh, not uh, last weekend, but the weekend before on the Financial Times, um, an interview on, an interview to, what's his name? Andrei Kozirev, who was the Prime Minister of Yeltsin, Oh, the foreign minister for Yeltsin, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was a moderate. He was uh, uh, really uh, um, somebody that uh, 
on the style of Gorbachev. I mean, that wanted a change. And, and in the interview, he lives in the States. It's more than 10 years that he lives in the States. And um, in the interview, to, he says that, uh, as you said, Yeltsin was a, was a weak man and uh, um, one of the reasons he says uh, not to diminish Ukraine, but uh, one uh, people knew that when he was drunk, he would say yes to everything. So he was uh, between the lines saying that uh, some of the best things he did was for that. Mm. Was for, but having said that, what he says is that uh, um, Putin can be stopped. The West can stop Putin because. Uh, uh, there's uh, the nationalists, uh, it's still strong. Nationalism is still strong, but the West has to fight for uh, reduce the power of uh, Putin. And uh, of course, the, the point uh, was that uh, for Gorbachev, the, he knew the nationalists, he knew that that would be a lot of blood, uh, Russian blood spread. And, uh, but maybe the West has to do something on this and to, to stop letting things go as they are going, giving money to Putin, selling the Emerald Code to the oligarch or to the Orlando Best Palace to... to I mean, there's something, we have a responsibility on this. Yeah. And I think that uh, um, also, you know, if you think of the escalation of terror that has taken place in Russia since when Putin is there, I mean, he killed uh, with radio, the radioactive poison people against him in London. I mean, well, we say the same for the CIA around the world, huh? <laughs> but we don't talk about that because we are Westerner. I will get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. Let me share with you uh, something from Mauro Magatti, who is my sociological mentor, who wrote on Avenire on the 1st of March. By bringing war back to the heart of Europe, Putin has definitely broken the global liberal order that arose after the fall of the Berlin War. Then Magatti pointed out, Putin intends to test the West resistance. And maybe he's also doing it now, not only with war, but with gas. Yeah. You know, how cold do you want to be next winter? Where well, I would say, let's be cold. I, let's, I would say the same. <laughs> let's stop giving money to these, to these men. Uh, but of course, I'm not an economist. I'm not uh, somebody in power. Uh, but it seems really we're so afraid of not having enough gas, as well as that this could expand. Why do I underline this? Yes, what Magatti, who is a sociologist as well as an economist, is totally right. But I want to look at what also another sociologist, Ulrich Beck, German sociologist, wrote. He pointed out that we should move from what the, in the United States is called Declaration of Independence, we should move to a declaration of interdependence, which means cooperate between nation or die. And Beck also uh, understand that this must be on a global scale because the traumatic vulnerability of all and the consequent responsibility for all, including one's own survival. 
Beck says that na nationalism is particularly toxic. Mm. So he proposed a cosmopolitan perspective. Could this be the real reset? Or am I being naive? As much, sorry, as much naive as you know I was, perhaps I was not, but I would like to call my, myself naive when I was looking at the COVID pandemic. And there was a book coming out in, in, in August titled uh, Lockdown Therapy, co-author with Monica Lucci. And this book, I propose that COVID is an opportunity to de decelerate for an inner and outer balance for uh, looking at interiority and spirituality, the creativity of the soul. But actually, the more we go on in the post pandemic with this war, I find myself as naive and that Michel Olbeck was right. The war will be the same after the pandemic, only a little worse, where actually he was wrong because the war will be the same, but much more worse. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with, uh, with Magatti and on what you said. I also think that uh, even if uh, not having, even if the Cold War had never finished for Russia, for us, it was important because we, in these uh, 30 years and more, many of these countries has entered Europe and uh, they experience and they bring also their experience to us, old, uh, old European. And I think this is an important uh, aspect even if i mean in, we have uh, um, some issues that but uh, i think that when the iron cur curtain fall it was a real a possibility to establish democracy in these countries and uh, I have hopes that this time, even if uh, the war in Ukraine is something very destabilizing for, for all of us, we are learning how important is this world, this world in which we believe. Look at uh, Poland, where the internal conflict has stopped in this moment, and they all try to be focalize on what is important. And I think uh, maybe, as you say, I'm uh, naive, but I think that I hope that uh, we are learning how important is uh, for a democratic, um, for a democracy to protect uh, um, his people, to, to protect the people, to give uh, support to, to people at all costs, as we did for COVID. Yeah. Even if it's not enough, I mean, because uh, we are still thinking as uh, nations. But the environmental issue, it's the planet, not the nation. Anyway, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is important, I think, that we become more aware, and I hope this war helps us on this, to become more aware that we have, uh, as Europeans, to be in a way more independent, because we don't have to forget that Trump decided that he was retiring the money for... for the, so, anyway, but... but Besides that, uh, we have to use our sense of responsibility as democratic countries to protect uh, people 
and uh, because you know one of the things that happens in the last uh, 30 years uh, because after the war we were aware that uh, it was important to have uh, for example a sanitary service for everybody and uh, and this little by little has retired is eroded. Yeah. This makes me think of Pier Paolo, pa Pier Paolo Pasolini, who is one of the most important Italian intellectual, but also European of the 20th century, who was born 100 years ago. And his uh, view on the capitalism, yeah, which is really an erosion. But we have, I think, our moral duty is not only to look at what is happening at Russia, at Ukraine, at what is war, but also to look at the West as a sort of mea culpa. What is different between this war and the crap, and I say crap, perpetrated by the United States since World War II, just to name a few, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. What about the U US invasion and occupation of polit or political destabilization since 1946 under the guise of liberating countries? And since 1991, when Iraq was invaded, under the pretext of spreading liberal democracy and kill the authoritarian uh, leader, who was actually their very close friends until a few years before. Maurizio Ferrara, who is an Italian journalist, wrote on the 7th of March that the US invasion of Iraq um, he looks at the invasion of Iraq and underlines that some commentators observed that it was a predetermined carnage, just like that of the last month in Ukraine, which took place after months of preparation. Then Maurizio Ferrara reminds us that the Nobel Prize for Literature Svetlana Alexievich has drawn a very clear picture of the imperiality impulses, not only of Putin, but also of a large part of the Russian population, as you and I underlined before. So the long wake of Homo Sovieticus and before that of the Tsarist tradition. And what, the, and what about the imperialistic or the imperialist impulses of the US? And apart from the US, every time the British invaded and occupied a country in the 18th and 19th and 20th century, they created problems and civil wars once they left. Look at Kenya, Cyprus, Palestine, only to look at a few. Well, look at what is going on now in Hong Kong. And they still occupy Ireland, one could say. Are the action of the... <coughs> Apologies. I see. <coughs> <Always> Salute. <laughs> Are the action of the British Crown and the death caused any different than those of Stalin, the US or Putin? When colonial Britain occupied countries and took everything from them, or when the capitalist US invaded countries for geopolitical reason and for the goods. I mean, we are Italians and we were really not the best, thanks God, in our imperialism, mm -hmm. but we are also responsible for that point of view, oh, yes, of for allowing that, that even if you go back, back, back in time. But a really important question is, what about the US? What about Britain? Yeah, yes, the US liberated Europe, we have to be thankful. And French too, I mean. And, and the Russian. And the Russian. But it's really important to understand what is the difference between what is happening now, what has been happening since 1946, and even since the 90s. When Bush father took power, he spoke to the nation on the 11th of September 1989, talking about a new order of peace, bilateralism, where there are not going to be top-down relationship. But then the new order was Iraq, Afghanistan, IS, Syria, and gone on, on. Well, I think the responsibility of colonialism is big for Europe, for the European, and uh, in general, it's a big responsibility. And, um, I'm old and I won't see the end of it, but even your generation, that you are much younger, but I mean, what the, the colonialists did, 
I mean, it's still there to see. No. And uh, it's a responsibility at many levels. And, um, but here too, I think that we should consider what we did as a way not to repeat. No, and so even when we speak of uh, Russia or of the pathology of Putin, of what Putin is doing, we have to keep an eye on what we West do, still do, or did. Because we don't have to forget that now the war is played also on, fina on finance. And uh, I mean, this is another aspect. And uh, one of the things that I'm happy to say is that I always fought against all the war, against Vietnam, against all the wars. I went when there was a manifestation, I went and even remember that uh, in the end of uh, uh, and for peace, but not for the peace in general, for peace, stop producing armament, stop producing weapons. And I remember a manifestation in the 80s with the metal mechanici, I don't know in English, anyway, of the de la Breda, of Breda, the, in the, the big industry. Because we manifested, we had several manifestations because one a conversion of the industrial plan was to build the part of the tank, of the local tanks. And so the, the workers did manifest against this idea. But you know, I think that the only, I'm not sure of this, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that the only industry remain in, 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 in Italy, in, in our country, is that of weapons. I don't know if it's still tanks. This is another aspect. If you produce, produce weapons, you will have to use them. And you will send them. So we, we, I don't like the false consciousness. So that's why I tend to say we have uh, our responsibility, even if I'm happy of having been protesting against this. But in the end, in the end, we go back to to Ilman again. Love that no other love has been able to overcome. To overcome. Last question for you or consideration again from Maurizio Ferrara, because maybe it goes online with what you said and with our hope that could transform into being naive. He said that the war in Iraq gave an important shock to Europe, and this is true. It was the fir big first differentiation from the US, mm. from the UK. I was in London at that time, and I remember in March 2003, I was marching in London against, uh, not for peace, because it's impossible to march for peace when there is a war, but against. Yes. So in the wake of massive and street demonstrations everywhere in, in Europe and the US, Maurizio Ferrara underlines that two great European intellectuals, uh, Jürgen Habermas and Jacques Derrida, ask themselves the question, what binds European together with respect to the international order or in comparison with the US? They, their answer was a political mentality different from the American one and based on some common traits, an aversion for the use of force, first of all, and therefore an insistence on law and respect on the international legality. Support for a global system based on liberal, multilateral, and on human rights. Fruit of the past inspired 
by opposite principle and characterized by a century of bloody carnage, precisely this mentality had pushed Europe to build for it, to build Europe, has pushed Europe to build a foreign and security policy anchored to the EU, EU overcoming the stupid statistic of war and these are important traits. Yes. Yes. I wonder whether this is the question to you, Europe didn't look at Ukraine 2006, 2008, 2014 as a true European countries, so still being too much Russian or, or Soviet, and turn away. But what Ukraine are telling us, we want to belong to these yes. spheres, not club mentality, but where these traits are so important. For me especially, um, a political mentality based on the aversion to use force and therefore an insistence on law and respect for international legality, support for a global system based on liberal multilateralism, institutions and on human rights. Well, you know my passion for Derrida and Derrida was a pianoir. So he came from Algeria, and uh, so he knew quite a lot about uh, the colonialism, and uh, in fact, uh, that was probably the last uh, French war, colonial war, in Algeria. And uh, I only, I can only agree on what he he says, and also it's really important that we open ourselves to the um, to the multilateralism and to the collaboration and to the idea that uh, uh, we have to collaborate because yes there's only one planet and this planet is asking that we do something Especially after two years of pandemic, now with this war, there is not the only war that is going on. No, it's not the only war that is it's, going it's on. It's perhaps only, let's put it this way, white war, but it's not the only war. I, I totally agree with you in this. We, we have a need to move to toward a co-construction of meaning yes. with pluralism, with differences, and maybe even difficulties to integrate these differences. Yes. But, this co-construction is fundamental and my idea of working on literature was related to this. Yes. Um, then that probably interests only me, but it doesn't matter, it's the idea of, uh, of this co-construction and uh, collaboration and to fight if it's necessary. Yes. Thank you, Caterina. Thank you to you, Stefano. Thank you. It was very nice to speak together. Thank you. Yeah. A, a beautiful conversation. Ciao. Ciao, Carlo. Ciao. <laughs>